let's talk about super mice. I'm not talking about Mighty Mouse. I'm talking about super mice. Uh, <laughs> they are on their way, that's right. Uh, scientists at the University of Rochester in New York have created a super mouse, and we've got some info for you. Researchers found that the super mouse is much smarter than traditional mice. Basically, they uh, implanted human brain cells in a normal mouse, that's what happened here. In one test that measures the ability to remember a sound associated with a mild electric shock, the humanized mice froze for four times as long as other mice when they heard the sound, suggesting that their memory was about four times better. All right, super mice, I think this is sort of the plot of Spider-Man 2, wasn't the lizard, wasn't that what he was trying to do to get the extra arm kind of thing? Like, we've heard about this kind of stuff, Island of Dr. Moreau, there's plenty of movies on this kind of genetic splicing animal human stuff. Um, this seems pretty cool, this seems pretty cool to me, like that we can maybe do something here to, I don't make animals smarter, or what are we figuring yeah. out? <laughs> I mean, I think it's pretty cool. Make us I dumber, mean, I don't know, we're all gonna look about, cheese. We've uh, known about Pinky and the Brain for a long time already, I don't know why this is news. Um, <laughs> Great theme song, by the way. Pinky and the Brain, okay, anyways, I'm not gonna go into that, but no, I think it's really One cool. One is a genius, I mean, the other's insane. Thank you. <laughs> oh, that's the only other part I remember. Yeah, go ahead, sorry. No, I just think it's cool because we can use the research done on these mice to help people, you know, who have different diseases that like myelin sheath degradation and stuff. Like we can help build that back up with oligodendrocytes and stuff that they're using from the glial cells. So, you know, so I mean stuff like this. Words. He doesn't know. That was all, he that... doesn't know what you just said. Okay, well, okay. So, yeah, to so, back so, up for okay. the regular person okay, at the table. So, so they have glial cells and they can turn into either astrocytes or oligodendrocytes. The astrocytes are used more for like repair and different things like that and neurotransmission and the oligodendrocytes are used to make myelin, which can also, you know, like if you have myelin sheath degradation, different diseases like multiple sclerosis, um, you know, you could use it to repair things like that. So, I mean, whenever you do research like this, you could take the information and use it to help people. Um, but I'm not really worried about a super mutant mouse taking over. Yeah. So, you, so I'm just going, that's a little superhero -y. A little, a little bit. Yeah, because I mean, then we'd have to have someone, like maybe a teenager <laughs> from Queens, would have to be bitten by right. a radioactive spider to then deal with the uh, map. You know what I mean? It's a lot. I'm just putting this stuff out legitimate there. Legitimate science yeah, right yeah, yeah, there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I should be prepared So for that. I'm going to back up a little bit yeah. and say, so, okay. What's actually happening here is that these researchers decided to take human cells yeah. and, like you said, inject them into mouse brains. And what they found was fucking amazing, which was that the mouse brains took the cells, not only integrated them into the architecture of the brain, but actually proliferated them. So over time, we've got two types of cells in our brain, two gross types of cells. I've said gross a lot. This been, That's the word a, of the day. We have neurons, which are kind of like the, the functional units in the brain, and they're the ones that do the chemical um, and electrical transmission. And then we have glial cells, which outnumber neurons like 10 to one. And glial cells are support cells. They do lots of things, like you said. They provide scaffolding and architecture. They myelinate the neurons, which is put a sheath around them so that transmission happens faster. Um, lots of things, microglia clean up, they're a little bit of a, an immune response. So what they found is that when they injected the human cells into the mouse brains, the mice maintained their own neurons, their own functional units, but they, they, they took on the human glia, and over time, they lost their own glia, and they actually became more populated with the human glia. So now, there's this crazy hybridized brain that's functioning on its own. It took it in, and it's yeah. able to function on its own. That, in and of itself, is amazing. It has absolutely nothing to do with these very, very early findings of memory improvement, or like super, mal this, is all, this is all media bullshit. I say don't give that a moment of thought. What they've provided here is a mouse model to be able to study human diseases of the glial system because they can do it in vitro in a way that would never be ethical in a human brain. You can't go in and tinker with a human brain and then see what happens to the patient. Right. So now they can do things in a mouse model that they could only do in vitro before, meaning in a Petri dish. Now they can actually do it in the mouse and see what happens. This is a wait and see moment if memory is improved, if we've got improvement of these kinds of disorders of myelin sheaths and things like that, but it could open up a whole new realm of research that's really exciting. Yeah, I suspect I know the answer on this, but where do you guys stand on testing on animals in general? Now I get that of course this is different, testing something like this is certainly different than testing for uh, lipstick. Right, mm -hmm. and I was just gonna say, it depends on what it's for. I mean obviously if, if we are looking to make you know, scientific advancement sometimes this type of thing is necessary. If, if we're gonna help, you know, cure human diseases, then, 
you know, yeah, go for it. But if we're just dropping, you know, shampoo into eyes of rabbits, you know, just don't put the stuff in your eyes. <laughs> you know, how hard is that? So, I mean, like, I, I am largely against animal testing for cosmetics, you know, that are to that degree, where you're just literally dropping acid in eyes of, of animals. But stuff like this, you know, is, is kind of a necessary. Do they ever find that the acid in the eye doesn't hurt? Like, you know, is it, is it not. <laughs> like, wow, we didn't expect this outcome. It hurts. Yeah. Well, and this is something that I, I oftentimes am really um, a little bit upset about when you look at media approaches and um, activist approaches to animal research is that they try to... Uh, they try to see equivalency between scientific research and, like you said, cosmetic research. That's some bullshit. Yeah. That's stuff that happens with no IRB approval. That's stuff that happens in private medical or private um, uh, corporate institutions, you know, pet food companies, cosmetic companies, things like that. But when we talk about legitimate science, government funded science, science that's happening at public and private universities, there are insane protocols that have to be covered. Yeah. You can't do research on animals, if there are uh, certain ethical ramifications, it has to be minimally invasive to the animal to get the desired outcome. It has to be minimally um, painful to the animal. You're always trying to improve the, the safety and the health of the animal. I, I, I definitely see cutoffs with animal research. I have a hard time with the idea of doing animal research on um, dolphins, elephants, and great apes. Yeah. Um, but, but much below that, I'm a huge advocate of animal research. And, but I'm an advocate of talking about animal research in a responsible way. And I think a lot of times what happens is that the activists focus mm -hmm. on third rail things that aren't even the real conversation. Legitimate animal research is absolutely necessary for a functioning society and for improved medical care. And anybody who says that they're against animal research should never take another pill in their fucking lives <laughs> and they should never get surgery because none of that could exist without animal research. Yeah. Sorry, sorry to tell you, that's just the way it is. I have one great resource for this. Look up Speaking of Research. It's an amazing organization that advocates for animal research and disseminates appropriate information to the public that is not... Um, you know, valenced with kind of hysteria and, and media fear mongering. Well, there you go. All right, so look up Speaking for Research.